This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the DOJ is hitting AT&T hard. Details on the lawsuit that could block AT&T's $85 billion takeover of Time Warner. And Uber speeds up its driverless push, striking a deal with Volvo. Details on the tie-up ahead. Plus, more deal-making in the chip industry, what Marvel's $6 billion acquisition of Cavium means amidst continuing consolidation. But first, to our lead and a developing story, the U.S. Justice Department is suing to block AT&T's $85.4 billion takeover of Time Warner. This deals a major blow to the carrier's bid to create a media and telecommunications empire. AT&T's chief counsel said it is confident that the court will reject the government's claims and the company is holding a press conference where CEO Randall Stevenson is expected to speak. We will bring you all the headlines as they come in. But first, our Bloomberg Deals reporter Ed Hammond just listened in on the DOJ call. He joins us now. Also with us, our Bloomberg editor at large, Corey Johnson, and our guest host for the hour, Bob O'Donnell, Technologist Research President. Ed, I want to start with you. You've been listening in on that call. What is the Justice Department's rationale here? You know, they've come out really, really swinging for this deal. They They've said it's uh, illegal. They've said it's harmful to consumers. Their, their rationale is essentially that, look, yes, it's a vertical merger, which traditionally you would see those deals fly through. But they're saying this just concentrates too much power uh, in the hands of one company, in this case, in, in AT&T. And it gives AT&T, uh, I suppose, too much clout to determine which of its competitors get which content, to sort of uh, prioritize uh, its own stuff that it would be taking in through Time Warner. So it, it's a really, really interesting and, and, and almost unheard of of um, kind of case for the Department of Justice to come out against what does, at least on paper, look like a very pure vertical merger. And, you know, Corey, in the weeks leading up to uh, Macon Del Rahim taking over this position at the Justice Department, it seemed like everything was moving forward. And now, suddenly in the last month, things have changed, which begs the question, yeah. Is this politically motivated? Does this have to do with the president's dislike of CNN? There, there has been some reporting, uh, Jesse Eisinger out of ProPublica among them, uh, saying that, that this really did come from the staff and that this didn't come from the politically appointed people at, uh, in the department, that the suggestion really was that this was about market concentration. Now, the lawsuit is certainly going to try to bring up whatever it can, including going into what the president has said, bringing up the things that the president has said both on Twitter and perhaps in private to look at how that may have influenced the deal and just to kind of uh, uh, throw some mud at this thing. But uh, this, this is a pretty tough suit. And uh, the suggestion that it is a concentration of power is interesting to see uh, from this, uh, the, this, uh, this current FCC. Bob, what's your read here? Well, my take is if, in fact, this is considered a consolidation of power, how do we think about Google, Facebook, all the big tech companies? Arguably, there's a lot more power and influence in those companies. So if I'm one of them, all of a sudden, I'm more nervous because the regulatory environment suggests and the legal environment suggests that they're good, they could be going after large companies with influence. Ed, do you get the sense that this could have a broader ripple effect or that this is very specific to this particular deal? No, it's absolutely going to have a broader ripple effect. I think there's, there's sort of no way that this doesn't have, at least in the immediate term, sort of a chilling effect on big ticket M&A. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is a, a, a sort of a case really about what we constitute power to be because you had this traditional thing that power was something it was only to do in concentrated markets. This is really a question of absolute power. And if the DOJ take this to court and go through with it, and if they succeed in their case, you're going to see lots of people who would have done mergers sort of similar to this in terms of vertically integrating companies. They're going to have to think twice. So I think you're going to see people really pull back from some of the bigger, uh, potentially more contentious deals. And then you throw in the unpredictability of Trump. And look, it's whether or not there was political interference, we don't know yet. Obviously, AT&T think there was. But Trump was very vocal that he didn't like this deal and he doesn't like CNN. And guess what? CNN is one of the main assets that uh, the D Department of Justice apparently have asked AT&T to divest from. Uh, Randall Stevenson, the CEO of AT&T, Corey, has already said spinning off CNN is not an option, right. that they want CNN. But there is an opportunity here to negotiate. 
Could that be part of a negotiation? Well, it looks like negotiation ended today, or probably ended a few days ago when the news of this came out. And the suggestion that CNN might get spun off and that that would be okay with them, they might have worked that out before today, but now they're going to court. Now, uh, we, we don't know really what was offered and not offered beforehand, or just behavioral changes that, that AT&T might have uh, promised, as we've seen in earlier mergers. But it's important to also understand how CNN works within all of the, the uh, cable empires at Time Warner. Time Warner is able to insist that if a, if a cable carrier or somewhere wants to carry CNN, they'll be told, you can have CNN if you take TNT, if you take TBS, if you take all of our other offerings. So the, the, uh, the Time Warner is able to sell many, many cable networks by having a crown jewel in CNN. It's not just a standalone business there. And that's why they have headline in TBS and TNT on all these other carriage, uh, carriage everywhere. And that's why, a great source of revenue for, uh, for uh, Time Warner. And as a result, you've got Time Warner uh, really recognizing that they need to keep that as part of their business and AT&T wanting to keep that as part of the Time we're actually getting headlines now out of the Justice Department. A Justice Department official saying that the lawsuit has nothing to do with President Trump, was not influenced by President Trump or anyone else in the White House. But that doesn't mean it won't come up in the trial. Right. You know? yeah, and, 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 of and, and that is the line, that. right? I mean, of course they're going to say that, right? Obviously, they would have to the say party that. party line. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely the party line. But, but you know, we do have to think about how people are consuming clever. content. Party line? Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about AT&T? Uh, Oldie yeah. but goodie. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have to think about how people think about and consume media and content these days. And all of that is changing. Therefore, the rules, I think, are changing. And I think that's what we have to think about, the potential implications of what's going on here. An AT&T Time Warner merger would pose a level of competitive harm not seen in decades. Okay, Ed, that, this is what a Justice Department official is saying. What is next? What, how does this process play out from here? Well, that, it certainly doesn't sound like settlement language, does it? So, uh, <laughs> no, I, I think that they're obviously going to go to court on this one. Um, it seems very unlikely that they're going to find some kind of resolution beforehand. Uh, AT&T genuinely believe they have a winnable case here. Uh, they think there has been some level of political interference, and they also think that this is without precedent. They actually said almost immediately when the Justice Department came out this afternoon, uh, DOJ, uh, sorry, AT&T put out a very aggressive statement saying the lawsuit is a radical and inexplicable departure from decades of antitrust precedent. So they feel that this is the DOJ essentially overreaching and um, they obviously will go to court and hope to win this case. But I think that the thing, and we touched upon this a moment ago, like this will have a chilling effect on deals in the near term. Corey, uh, in 2011, when AT&T dropped its proposed bid for T-Mobile, you right. and I covered that at nauseum. Could we see something similar happening here? You know, a lot of those deals, companies keep wanting to get bigger. They keep wanting to eliminate competition. They keep wanting to have let consumers have less choice. Ultimately, what's you know, we're always going to see deals like this. But what we what we've seen here is that the the world isn't very clear to these companies. Whatever guidance they're getting about what the Justice Department might accept, what the FCC might uh, accept, uh, it seems like the companies aren't really getting a clear look at these things in advance and are going through the trouble of proposing these deals. Uh, I'm sure that AT&T is, is, is furious at what's going on with the Department of Justice and with their bankers who told them that this deal could go through. And what do you expect the consequences to be if this deal does not go through? Well, I like Corey's point. Blame the bankers. It's always a good start. I um, look. I think. I think if this bankers doesn't go, don't think so. If this doesn't go through, look across at what's happening at Fox at the moment. You have a, a number of companies that are trying to buy assets from Fox. This is, you know, there is still a lot of um, potential acquirers for good content. So if this deal falls apart, and I think AT and T have until April before someone else could potentially come in and break this up, but it's entirely possible that you would see other suitors come in and try and buy either all or part of Time Warner but I think if this if they go to court and this thing gets blocked then it, it it's really is uh, you know it does not bode well for people attempting uh, these big uh, sort of contentious mergers all right we will be fo following this of course throughout the show we're gonna be listening to that live webcast set to start at the bottom of the hour from the Time Warner Center in New York where at t CEO Randall Stevenson is expected to speak Ed Hammond our deals reporter in New York Corey Johnson our editor-at-large uh, Bob O'Donnell you are sticking with me tech analysis research all right coming up consolidation in the chip industry continues Marvel's six billion dollar plan to buy Cavium and the latest on what Qualcomm investors want to see from Broadcom next and Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.
A big takeover in the chip making business. Marvel Technology has agreed to buy Cavium for about $6 billion in cash and stock. Marvel specializes in chips that control hard disk drives. That is a market that is no longer growing. Cavium makes network processors. And speaking of deals in chip making, Qualcomm investors now say they could be open to a Broadcom deal, but at a higher price. You'll remember that Qualcomm's board had rejected Broadcom's $105 billion acquisition offer last week. Bloomberg Intelligence is Anand Srinivasan, who focuses on the semiconductor industry, joins me now here in the studio, along with our guest host for the hour, Bob O'Donnell, president of Technolysis Research. So, Anand, first of all, what do you make of Qualcomm's response here? Look, it's, it's logical to try and extract more dollars out of the deal, but... Uh, but, you know, if you step back and look at the big picture, we think that the combination actually makes sense, right? So this is a com the, it, it places adjacent parts of the cell phone together, um, and Hawk, uh, Hawk Tan, the CEO of Broadcom, might be able to settle disputes with Apple, which has been the primary thorn in Qualcomm's site. Mm -hmm. If you're able to put that together, it, uh, it adds a tremendous amount of value to Qualcomm, uh, and hence to uh, Broadcom, which is... Um, if it were to be acquired. What about at the price on offer? Look, uh, insofar as is, is, is it possible that um, Hawk Tan offers $5 more or $10 more to get the deal done? Yes. Um, from our deal, uh, from our deal depth perspective, uh, he's actually pretty, pretty well leveraged to try and make this deal happen. Um, at the end of the day, you know, that $80 a share that people are angling for is also a psychological high price over the last five years. Mm. So, and Hawk had his, has historically not uh, cowed to those higher price demands usually. Um, and it might be a, a, a little bit of a barter transaction here as to whether the deal gets done at that price. Obviously, there's been a ton of consolidation in the chip industry. I want you guys to take a look at a chart in the Bloomberg. G hashtag BTV5038 shows you just how chip sales have been rising at their fastest pace since 2010 globally and yet more consolidation bob than ever fewer players well than i mean ever. the issue is look it's very hard to compete out there if you're a smaller specialized player and what you're seeing is a conglomeration of different technologies being put together in these companies right i mean Think about what Intel has done. They went from just the CPUs, now they're competing on modems and FPGAs and all these other things. All of these companies recognize they've got to have a combination of different components because across the board, whether it's automotive, compute, mobile phone, all IoT, all of these areas require multiple types of technologies, and that's going to be important. But one thing I'll throw out, two things I'll throw out there on the Qualcomm Broadcom deal. Number one, obviously, there is a concern from a monopolistic perspective around Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, um, and you have to figure out what are they going to do because there's too much control consolidated there. The other thing is, culturally, Broadcom and Qualcomm are, are different types of companies. And there is a concern, would that have an impact in terms of uh, talent loss and things like that if this deal was to go through? Because there has been discussion about that. Um, you know, that's, that's a great point I want to make. But unlike other general consolidation, even large-scale consolidations, and this is not Intel Altera. Right. right. And, and the difference being Hawk Tan is in charge. Mm -hmm. Right. He has a very Someone good. Someone said to me, Hawk Tan gets what he wants generally. <laughs> he, he has a very clear idea of what he wants. Mm. And he has a very clear idea of what segments he wants to keep. And more importantly, in Semiland, what segments he wants to divest. Right. The Wi-Fi business is an overlap. And that's we think that it's a roughly seven billion dollar business that can be punted pretty quickly. The other part of it is we have thrown this idea. It's it's uh, it's from far left field, but at the same time, if you, if you were to somehow put a moat around QTL, which is the licensing portion of the of the business for Qualcomm, could that be sold off? And that could be that could clear a whole host of problems from a regulatory perspective. How does the Cavium Marvel deal fit into this, Bob? Well, that one seems pretty straightforward. I mean, I think there's a nice combination of technologies there, and again two relatively smaller players coming together. And what's interesting about that is when we, there's this kind of general idea of edge computing that's growing, right? The idea of the cloud computing coming down to the edge. And this combination, and uh, Cavium is now talking about ARM servers, uh, and this combination would give them the capability to create some very interesting products for, or develop the components for products on the edge. And I think that could be a big deal for them. Interestingly enough, the main competitor to both uh, Marvell and Cavium Cavium is Broadcom. Yes. Well, Broadcom is going to be everyone's competitor at this rate, given yeah. how many companies 
And, and you thought. know, they're, 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 hawk tennis and, is... You know, what are the consequences of that? You got, you got to be in semis, go big or go home. Right. Mm. right? You, you cannot afford, and as Bob said, you cannot afford to be a small niche player and think that you're going to go somewhere, anywhere. Right. You have to have uh, manufacturing capacity, you have to have product, and you have to have distribution channel. And you can't do that if you're a small company. So I'll throw one out from left field. The only thing I thought of when I was thinking about this is what if Samsung came in and said, you know what, we want Qualcomm. Because Samsung does, you know, raw components. They do screens, they do memory, they could do radios, you know, and certainly they've got the manufacturing. I'm not saying anything like that was ever going to happen, but when you think about ways that this world could go, that would not be the strangest deal ever done. Interesting thought there. Okay, Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis, you're sticking with me. Anand Srinivasan of Bloomberg Intelligence, great to have you here in San Francisco today. Thanks for stopping by. Still ahead, Alibaba goes shopping, picking up a slice of China's top hypermarket chain. We'll look behind a deal worth almost $3 billion. And a feature I want to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message. Play along with the charts we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Big news for Tencent. The tech giant has become the first Chinese company to be valued at more than $500 billion. This coming just three months after it topped $400 billion for the first time ever. Tencent joins Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook as the only companies valued at more than $500 billion. Another Chinese tech giant in the news, Alibaba is making another bet on brick and mortar retail. China's largest e-commerce company has agreed to take a $2.9 billion stake in the country's biggest operator of Walmart style hypermarkets. Alibaba is acquiring 36% of Sun Art Retail. Joining us now, Bloomberg Tech's Selena Wang and our guest host for the hour, Technalysis Research President Bob O'Donnell. So Selena, what's the motivation here and how does this fit into Alibaba's overall bet? On offline so retail. this gives Alibaba access to about 400 of these hypermarkets all around China. And this is just the latest in a string of deals Alibaba has done in offline. They're now in grocery and department stores and electronic stores. And this also helps them to access consumers in lower tier, smaller cities that weren't really familiar with a regular shopping on Alibaba before. Now the big long term strategy is that they want to use their colossal amounts of data that they have from e-commerce, combine it with the the virtual world with the offline world make the consumer experience infinitely better as well as streamline the inventory supply management and this also gives Alibaba lead against what Walmart is doing with JD in China they've been trying to turn around the business there and now Alibaba also has a significant stake in this hypermarket world Taking a look at the Bloomberg here, another chart, G hashtag 4955 you can see just how revenue growth uh, at Sun Art is slowing down, and so the hope is that this would reverse that trend. Bob, any coincidence you think about them announcing it during the big week for U.S. retailers and Amazon especially? No, obviously not. I mean, but I think we do have to be very careful about comparing what happens in China and what happens in the U.S., right? I mean, we've talked about this before. I mean, you know, there's certain things that will fly in China that would not fly in the U.S. Uh, but fundamentally, look, retail is being rethought, rebuilt all over the world, and people are experimenting. I think it's fair to say that this is probably more of an experiment than anything else because, you know, look, the sales have been declining. There are some challenges there. I, I think Selena's point about getting to those lower tier cities is incredibly important because we all we tend to focus, you know, like on big cities here in the U.S., big cities in China. But the real mass growth opportunity is going to be in those lower tier cities. And if, in fact, they have strong presence in those kinds of places, that is a great way to kind of step them up into this whole new vision of retail. Talk to us, uh, Selena, about you know the the experiences that they're trying to create in the physical stores that they do have as a sort of enticement to get shoppers to mm -hmm. 
get out and go shopping, right. essentially. I think Bob made a great point. Part of it is an experiment. They have these Homa supermarkets where it's a cashless experience. You check in, check out through their mobile payments app. They combine it with their Alipay uh, mobile app as well. But at the same time, it's a very expensive experiment. They've already invested billions and billions into this. They don't see it. They see it as much more than just an experiment. But it's also not a direct comparison to what Amazon is trying to do with Whole Foods. Exactly. Whole Foods, yeah. Kohl's, like, yeah. you know, it's not unheard of that something like this yes. could happen in the United States. Definitely. But at the same time, the offline experience in China is woefully worse than what it is in the U.S. Whole Foods is already a pretty great shopping experience in China. These offline stores often just have terrible inventory management. They don't have a good fulfillment system. So there's a lot further that Alibaba can take these stores than what Amazon can potentially do with Whole Foods. So, Bob, where do you see this going? Well, you know, I think we are going to see companies figure out a mechanism to share the experience even more. I mean, and I'm not sure exactly how that's going to go, but there's this just my gut feeling is that people have kind of pulled back a little bit from the buying everything online. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a recognition that there's something about retail that makes sense, you know, especially for certain types of items. And it's just figuring out that balance, right? What's the right balance between offline and online? How do I incent people? What are the ways I can get them to think about different types of product categories from within my store? I mean, one big thing for sure is what's the range of products? Now, in China, like, everything is in the same store, right? We don't quite have as much. We have some of that here in the U.S., but not as much. And so I think there'll be some experimentation around, you know, types of, of, uh, of merchandise, for example, as well. We're actually going to talk about that a little bit more later in the show and the fact that, you know, a, s a smaller percentage of people are expected to turn out online for, for Black High Friday. Why is that? Um, Selena Wang, who covers Alibaba for us. Thanks so much. Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis. You're sticking with me. All right, coming up, Uber shifts into high gear with autonomous driving. We'll bring you the latest details on its order for more cars from Volvo. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of your first word news. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says that President Trump's decision to return North Korea to the list of countries designated as state sponsors of terrorism is part of the effort to discourage countries from doing business with the rogue regime. Speaking at today's White House briefing, Tillerson indicated the U.S. will continue to work with China in dealing with Pyongyang. We still hope for diplomacy, and this is the, the timing of this is just one of us concluding the process. There is a very specific designation process that we have to go through at the State Department to be able to meet the criteria to make such a designation, and we wanted to ensure we had fully met all those requirements. North Korea would join Iran, Sudan, and Syria on the list of state sponsors of terrorism. BuzzFeed is reporting that at a private dinner with Oracle CEO Safra Katz, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster mocked President Trump's intelligence. Sources tell BuzzFeed that at the July dinner, McMaster dismissed the president as an idiot and a dope with the intelligence of a kindergartner. Both Oracle and the Trump administration denied the comments that Katz later recounted. Violent clashes took place in Kenya Monday following a Supreme Court decision to uphold President Uhuru Kenyatta's re-election. Despite calls for calm by opposition leaders, at least two protesters were killed in confrontations with police. Nearly 100 people have died in the political unrest since Kenyatta's victory was initially overturned in August. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. Just after 5.30 p.m. here in Washington, 6.30 a.m. now in Hong Kong, we are joined by Bloomberg's Sophie Kararudin with a look at the markets. Sophie, good morning. Good morning, Alicia. Now, we had a risk-off start to Asian markets, but today we are looking at recovering some of those losses with futures pointing higher in Tokyo as well as in Australia. We have Aussie stocks then looking to recover some losses ahead of the RBA meeting minutes due on Tuesday. But shares in Wellington are losing ground. But overall, we may be looking to track U.S. stocks higher as Congress takes a break from tax stocks for Thanksgiving. And taking a look at the dollar rebounding, investors unfazed then by Fed Chair Yellen's 
resignation. Swings continue for the euro as Merkel said she'd rather face new German elections. I'm uh, Sophie Kamarud in, in Hong Kong. More up next with Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Our top story this hour, the U.S. Justice Department is suing to block AT&T's $85.4 billion takeover of Time Warner. This deals a major blow to the carrier's bid to create a media and telecom empire. Keep in mind, it was only two weeks ago that AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson said that the company has been preparing for litigation since they announced this deal. Am I surprised that uh, there are... Uh, statements that there might be litigation here. Yeah, of course I'm surprised. Am I concerned? It also might not surprise you that since the day we announced this, we've been preparing to litigate this deal. And uh, we have been very working very diligently on a litigation strategy and a litigation plan. So we are prepared. The company is set to hold a press conference momentarily where Randall Stevenson will be providing an overview of developments. We're going to monitor that. We'll bring you all the headlines as they come. First, though, Uber is buying 24,000 Volvo SUVs to ramp up its fleet of driverless cars. The order marks the first commercial purchase for the ride-hailing company. The XC90s will arrive at dealers between 2019 and 2021. The deal is also expected to boost Volvo's sales and lower the cost of its own autonomous cars planned for 2021. Our guest host for the hour, Bob O'Donnell, Tech Analysis Research President, joins me now along with our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. So, Corey, what do you make of this purchase? Well, it's really interesting. I think it shows how all of the major car makers are out there pushing really rapidly towards uh, more autonomous vehicles, deals with more uh, self-driving features or autonomy features. Uh, whether it's self-driving or not, though, they're not sort of getting to that hurdle. And that uh, it's, it's interesting to me that one of the way that it looks like this is going to work is Volvo's going to make a cutting-edge vehicle, but not a self-driving vehicle, pass it off to Uber, and Uber will make those final steps with software, probably using the hardware that Volvo's already got on the vehicle. It's interesting because this gives us some window into uh, Uber's self-driving efforts to date because they have this whole team of researchers. Well, you've probably seen them around the city of San Francisco. We've seen them around. We've yeah. seen photos of them. Um, but, you know, how does this kind of a partnership, Bob, what does it mean for the broader auto industry? Well, I mean, I, I think Corey brings up some good points. The, the main automakers are all trying to figure out ways to do this. But, look, let's remember that First of all, we're actually several years away from this stuff really being safe and working and well enough, I think. And I think the issue that we actually should be thinking about is the fact that Uber is in this position where if they don't start moving towards autonomous cars and the longer the gig economy questions start to be raised as they have been in London and other places, the more their whole business model gets challenged. So I think there's an effort here in part to drive to a focus away from some of those issues and focus on, oh, this is where we're going to go. I think the implications of that are actually pretty big and not everybody's thought through what those are going to be. What's your take on that? Well, I mean, I don't know that the regular, I, I, I don't know the regulatory environment is mm -hmm. ready for this. I don't know that th these cars are ever going to be safe. Right. And no one knows these cars are ever going to be safe. There is certainly a lot of hope around there, but there are some uh, enormous problems that may never be fixed, or as we like to say in Silicon Valley, we have yet to fix. But they may never be fixed, and it may be impossible for these cars to be fully self-driving. They have enormous implications for uh, the Uber business model, because if you think about that, the relationship between the car, the driver, and the passenger, and getting paid is, is everything for Uber. So the notion that they could somehow, uh, you know, the, the driver is actually a pretty cheap way to get a car moving around. Mm -hmm. uh, and the notion that these cars would be better is, is, is you know, at this point, right. given the price points, impossible. We just don't know it yet, and Bill Gurley, uh, early Uber investor, he was on the board. He no longer is on the board, but he has said he thinks this is decades out uh, rather than a few years out. And we can imagine that might have been uh, one area where he disagreed with uh, former CEO Travis Hallett. And Hallen. the spending. Yeah. This is a big, big investment. Yeah, right. It is a big, right. and by the way, it's not just the cars because the amount of hardware you have to add to the cars, like those cars you see around, those are hundreds of thousands of dollars right. each car because the technology to do the autonomous piece is still very expensive and it's going to be a while before that comes down in price. So what do you make of the fact that this is Volvo as opposed to any other car maker? Well, they've, we, they've been working with Volvo already in a lot of ways from what we read and I think I've seen a few on the streets of San Francisco. 
Francisco. But surely a lot of car makers would like to get a billion dollar ticket written. And Volvo uh, loves this as well because this will lower the cost because of the investment. They can use this money to invest in these cars so that everyone out there driving these uh, could drive one of these cars. It's also interesting that they're moving production of this car into the U.S. so it actually be made here uh, in the United States. It's also interesting given GM's relationship with Lyft. GM was also talking to Uber. There's a lot of incestuousness Absolutely. among these yeah. various players. Well, and again, like Corey said, I mean, everybody is trying to figure out how to get their piece of autonomous driving. Absolutely everybody. The car makers, these ride-sharing services, the semiconductor players, the software companies, the startups doing all this stuff. Everybody sees the potential opportunity, but there are so many questions that remain out there. I just, you know, again, it feels like it's a little bit of, a, oh, you know, hey, we're going to keep distracting you from what some of the core problems are going to be here, uh, especially if this gig economy issue uh, becomes a, a concern here in the U.S. All right, Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis, thank you. You're sticking with me, Corey Johnson, our editor at large. Thank you as well. We have been monitoring this live webcast coming out of the Time Warner Center in New York, where AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson is expected to speak. Uh, we are listening into the webcast. We will bring you any headlines as we have them. All of this in response to the DOJ now saying they will challenge uh, this merger between AT&T and Time Warner. Sticking with Uber, the ride-hailing company has been hit with an $8.9 million fine by Colorado for hiring employees with serious criminal or motor vehicle offenses. The Colorado Public Utilities Commission said it launched an investigation last year after a driver was accused of assaulting a passenger in Vail. The commission found nearly 60 Uber drivers with previous felony convictions were allowed to work in the state. Drivers included those with major traffic violations and a former prison escapee. Coming up, it is the annual holiday showdown, Black Friday versus Cyber Monday. Will online shopping take a dent out of brick and mortar retail's big day? That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. We are following a live webcast happening at the Time Warner Center in New York. That is AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson speaking there. Uh, he is responding to the DOJ now saying they will sue to stop the AT&T Time Warner merger. Uh, Randall Stevenson has said in the past they have been prepared in case litigation came their way. Uh, we will bring you ed ed more headlines as we have them. We are listening into this webcast happening right now. First of all, after months of hype, the Justice Department arrived to save the world, but not the box office in general. Warner Brothers tentpole generated $96 million in the box office, nearly $30 million short of estimates. This sent major movie stocks tumbling today. AMC fell by as much as 5% with Regal and IMAX losing a little over four points at their low. And Thanksgiving may be a few days away, but the holiday shopping frenzy is well underway. Traditional brick and mortar stores like Walmart are making preparations to handle the Black Friday crowd, while e-commerce rivals like Amazon are trying to lure customers with Cyber Monday deals. And according to a new Deloitte survey, 70% of holiday shoppers will be physically in stores on Black Friday, while 72% of shoppers will be online Cyber Monday. Joining me now to discuss our Bloomberg Gadfly columnist, Sarah Halzak, who covers the consumer and retail industries and still with me, my guest host for the hour, Technalysis Research President Bob O'Donnell. So Sarah, I will start with you. We've got a survey that shows that a lower percentage of people are going to be turning out online for Black Friday and, and that in fact a good number of people will actually be going to physical stores. What do you make of these sort of mixed results that we're seeing? I think it really just reflects the moment that we're in generally with the online shopping revolution right now, which is that people really do ping pong back and forth between these two channels. I think the vast majority of shoppers do shop both online and in stores, and you see that reflected in their plans for the holiday weekend. And I can tell you from interviewing people for the past five years on Thanksgiving and Black Friday and in stores, some of the reason they're out there in physical stores is about the prices, but a lot of it is just a social activity. I talked to tons of people who are there with their relatives, or with their children and they're just looking to get out of the house and uh, that's not going to change this year.
You know, Bob, it's interesting. For the last several weeks, I've been getting a lot of sales emails in my inbox, and it seemed like Black Friday started on November 1st. Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, the whole meaning of Black Friday is gone, right? Mm -hmm. it, there's, there's, it's meaningless at this point. Well, I, I hesitate. I thought about <laughs> it, and then I was like, I'm waiting till Black Friday. I know it's going to come down even more. Well, but the point of it being a social event, I think, is very true. I mean, that's been the case in, in our household, where it's, it's, you go out, it's, it's more the social event. Yeah, there's a couple of deals there but people do like to physically go out and, and try things but you know it is interesting because those deals have been coming for a long time like you said and so it's not really I think that really hammers home the point that it's not about the price because you could get that same price in a lot of cases other days so it's about the experience Sarah how much shopping is actually happening on mobile now and how is that affecting things here so I think that's an interesting uh, thing to look at here. So mobile is where a lot of the traffic is. For most retailers, it's over 50% of the traffic to their websites now. So it's crucially important you have fast page load times, that your app is working well, because people are really turning to that for information. And I think it's also interesting that mobile is now a very important part of the in-store experience. Increasingly, we see people using their devices inside the store to see if there are other colors available or other sizes available available online, they want to read customer reviews, maybe see if a product holds up well over time. So mobile is really integral to this whole weekend at this point. So Bob, when we look at the numbers on Cyber Tuesday or whatever it is, because there will still be deals happening <laughs> exactly. on Tuesday. What do you expect to see? Well, I think that we will see growth in retail because I, I do think, as Sarah said at the very beginning, it, we're in, in this moment in the online shopping experience where people feel like, okay, I, you know, I've done a lot of that. There is something to be said about the other side of it. And again, I think retailers have also learned over the last few years from some of their mistakes, and they're they're trying to make the experience. Of of shopping more interesting and more compelling. And things like the loyalty card clubs and things like that are, are getting people to think about uh, you know, working both online and in the store uh, in the same way. The mobile point is interesting. I mean, you know, it used to be showrooming would be you would go to the showroom at retail and then go buy online. Almost the exact opposite is happening now, where you, know, you do some preparation online and then you go into the store to see it and then you do more research while you're there in the store. And I think that just reflects the maturity of the online shopping process and how we've all evolved with it. Sarah, are you seeing any changes in strategy when it comes to the retail stores, the department stores, as we approach uh, this holiday? Yeah, it seems like they're really varied this year. So, for example, Target had been doing 10 days of deals for the last two years, really trying to fire off the confetti cannon, give you deals all the time. They've pulled back from that, felt like it was just too distracting for consumers, that they really want to have a good spate of deals on Thursday and Friday and, and win that way. So I think we see a lot of variety. Some are really going for this long stretch of deals, just trying to get you in the store as many days as they possibly can, and others are really trying to save their firepower for that big event day. The other thing is, Bob, you know, deals in November are one thing, but it, it really seems like deals are happening all year long. I mean, I feel like every weekend Gap is 50% off, J. Crew is 30% off, and, well, and it doesn't it doesn't really seem to bode well for these companies. Well, exactly. I mean, that's true. But, and then on the opposite side, you've got Amazon Prime Days, you know, throughout the year that feel like, you know, a Black Friday event in the middle of the summer mm -hmm. or whenever it may be. So, again, I, I think that notion that we kind of built up to for years and years and years around Black Friday and Cyber Monday, they're just starting to lose some of their meaning. And, and everybody is experimenting with how and where they can get people to come in and, and the manner with which they can get them to spend their dollars. So, Sarah, when, when it comes to the numbers, what are you going to be watching specifically? I think I'm going to be really watching for the strength of the Black Friday and the Cyber Monday e-commerce numbers. So I think uh, Cyber Monday is expected to be a, expected to be a 6.6 .6 billion dollar day online, and I think Black Friday is expected to be a bit less than that, about 5.5 .5 billion dollars. And here's what's really important: um, those are expected to be the fastest growing days of the season, even though they're coming off the biggest base. And so I think those will be sort of a good indicator of sort of where the consumer's head is at and how much online shopping we're going to see over the course of the whole season. All right, our Bloomberg Gadfly columnist, Sarah Halzak there. Thanks so much, Sarah, for weighing in. Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis, you are sticking with me.
Still ahead, our top story this hour, the AT&T Time Warner presser is underway. We've been listening to AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson saying the company will offer solutions to allow this deal to close. He has also told reporters that any agreement that would require divesting CNN is a non-starter. They said CNN is very important to them. We're going to keep listening in and bring you his comments as we have them. This is Bloomberg. Yes, um, look. We, we know that the president has been critical. Back to our top story, the U.S. Justice Department is suing to block AT&T's $85 billion takeover of Time Warner. Randall Stevenson, CEO of AT&T, is speaking at a press conference saying that they will offer solutions to close the deal, but divesting CNN is a non-starter. Joining us now from New York, Jennifer Ree, our senior analyst for litigation at Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Bob O'Donnell of Technolysis is still with me here in the studio. So, Jennifer, you've been listening into this call. You've read the DOJ's complaint. What are your takeaways? Well, you know, I think it's not really a surprise, at least to me. The way I read the complaint, it's a very typical vertical theory of harm. That is that the company will have, the merch company will have what is considered must-have content, and that it could be profitable for them to engage in a strategy of raising the price of that content to distribution rivals, because in the long run, they would, to the extent that the, the distribution refuses to take the content or pay for the content, they would lose subscribers who would move over to AT&T, DirecTV, to get that content. Now, Randall Stevenson has said they're going to offer a solution. They've said that divesting CNN, Bob, is a non-starter. They've said CNN, I mean, CNN is maybe the crown jewel of, uh, of Time Warner. That said, you have an acknowledgment from AT&T's lawyer just now saying that we know the president has talked about his dislike for CNN. Well, and we can't ignore the political side of this equation, right? I mean, we simply cannot ignore that. And there's going to be discussions back and forth. And we're never, the problem is we're never really going to know how much of an influence it has. But, you know, I mean, the interesting side about the vertical uh, uh, combination is that, of course, that just happened a few years back with Comcast and NBC, and that seemed to be fine. So there is arguably legal precedent there, and yet now it's being applied somewhat differently. And of course, I'm sure that's exactly the route that AT&T is going to follow. Jennifer, we know that this deal was on track until about a month ago when Macon Del Rahim took over the antitrust division. You know, how strong is the argument that there is a problem here, that this uh, vertical integration would be anti-competitive? Well, you know, Emily, it's going to come down to the evidence which you know has yet to be seen from what I saw in the complaint they were quoting several documents that they seem to have pulled from AT&T and DirecTV that didn't look good now those are just blurbs and sort of you know excerpts so we don't know what those documents said as a whole but it's going to come down to what the economists do and what they show in terms of the incentive and the ability of the company to engage in the kind of discriminatory strategies that the DOJ is alleging that they would engage in and also how strong their efficiencies are and their rationale for the deal um, and to the extent that the deal could have consumer benefits and, and the, you know the strength of those arguments on their side. So what specifically doesn't look good? Well you know some comments that that and again, you know, these are just excerpts, so you don't really know the entire context for the comment, but, but, but comments such as needing to combine the content with the distribution in order to sort of have a better, better model, model to better compete against some of the newer, more innovative options like the skinny packages through Sling TV, some of the overtop options. I mean, it looks, some of these suggested that some of the rationale for the deal was, in fact, to be able to have greater clout in the marketplace. Well, so explain to me, Bob, isn't any merger intended to improve a company's ability to compete? It certainly right? is. And, and you could make the argument that, in point of fact, AT&T is worried about its ability to compete with, you know, these skinny bundles, again, with the content that's being delivered via Facebook, via Google, via the, all these other new media, although they don't like to call themselves platforms, and, and all of a sudden that does change the dynamic, and I think that becomes the question mark. Certainly we're seeing the unbundling of a lot of this stuff, and the notion of being able to do over-the-top services is dramatically changing the whole cable TV. Uh, and, and satellite TV distribution mechanism. So a lot of these changes, I think, are going to happen anyway. The question is, will this deal drive those changes or not? 
And we're still listening to Randall Stevenson, the CEO of AT&T, speaking uh, with AT&T's lawyers here. Jennifer, what's next? What happens now? Well, you know, at this point that this starts the litigation, I mean, the complaint has been filed and what will happen is the parties will ask for this to be expedited. It likely will be expedited. We're going to see a short period of discovery. Certainly the companies are likely to seek okay. information about how politics might have played into this and, and a trial date will get set and uh, maybe right. four to six months. Jennifer Ree will have to leave it there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Bob O'Donnell, my guest host for the hour. Thank you both so much. We're going to continue uh, to monitor uh, this press conference. You can check out the headlines on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thank you all for watching. We will see you tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. At $35.